All right, so let's get started. Okay, so in first chapter, we're going to just talk about statistics in general without any use of software or any specific statistical terms. Uh, like I told you before, that's the textbook that you can buy really cheap from Amazon, right? Don't buy the latest edition because it's going to be expensive. The, the information that you will see in the textbook probably doesn't change all that much from one edition to another edition, right? Uh, but uh, the relevant concepts, terms, methods are still covered in the older uh, editions, versions of this textbook. Okay, so uh, let's first of all chit chat about what is statistics in general, right? Statistics is just a way to get information out of the data, okay? So uh, it's just a set of tools, that's how I view it at least, okay? Statistics is just a set of tools, uh, how we can process the data and get information out of that. So, uh, therefore, let's, let's spend a couple of minutes discussing what's the difference between the data and the information. Uh, data is uh, a bunch, a collection of raw, unprocessed facts, okay? For example, uh, you, you are in the, at, at the end of your uh, sophomore year, right? So you took four classes, four, four semesters, worth of classes at CNU, right? So uh, every semester, how many classes do you take on average? Five, right? About five, maybe sometimes more, maybe sometimes less, but on average, it should be five, right? So therefore, every semester, you have five grades, right? Uh, now, if you go online and download your uh, transcript, you will see all the grades. So, so far, it should be a collection of, what, five grades times four semesters. You have about 20 grades right now, right? Give or take a few. Uh, so when, when you uh, apply to the School of Business, for example, uh, what's important for the School of Business? What, what kind of stuff are they looking for when accepting or rejecting your application? Your GPA, right? So therefore, they look at your grades, but not all of them, uh, like we're not looking at individual, for example, science class that you took, right? <laughs> or, um, you know, English 123 that you took, okay? We do look at some of them, of course, right? But uh, one of the important things that School of Business has to look at is your GPA, right? If GPA is 3.0, then your application is probably going to be accepted if you achieve good scores in the pre-business classes as well, right? Uh, so therefore, um, the individual grades that you have achieved in your uh, all of your classes, pretty much, we can think of them as data, okay? Individual facts. But uh, to make a decision whether or not you are going to get accepted to the School of Business, we use the summary, right? And that summary is GPA. So that's pretty much an illustration of data versus information. Your grades, raw grades, are data. Every single grade is one data point. But out of that, we create a summary GPA, okay? So uh, in, in doing so, we're, of course, using st simple statistical tool, right? So each class has a grade, and the grade corresponds to a, a number of, you know, quality points, right? Uh, uh, and then we use just simple formula to compute our GPA, okay? But that's an example of how uh, statistics is used to process data and get that into the information. So information is data that was summarized somehow. Summarized means uh, we can uh, create, a, for example, chart or filter the data or uh, sort it in a certain order, uh, perform simple mathematical manipulation with this data, compute the mean, standard deviation, range, different percentiles, etc., etc. So create summary out of a bunch of numbers, right? Uh, even probably more illustrative example would be uh, Walmart, okay? How many transactions Walmart runs in one uh, fiscal year, in your estimation? What do you think? Just transactions? Yeah, just individual transactions. Yeah. Like you go in, you buy uh, 10 different items, right? So how many of these transactions with the payment they run every year? Tens of millions, probably billions, maybe even, right? Uh, so that's basically data for Walmart. Out of this data, Walmart creates summary. They get information out of that, right? So they run, for example, accounting reporting at the end of the fiscal year, and they get out of that balance sheet, profit and loss statement, cash flow statement, um, different managerial reports, cost reports, etc., etc., right? So they replace tens of billions of 
individual records about every individual transaction with just a handful of uh, summary numbers about how the company is doing, right? So statistics is just a way to process data and get information, and information has value for decision-making purposes. So if you're a Walmart executive, for example, and you want to find out what's the average uh, purchase, you can certainly do that, right? You can run all transactions, average out how much uh, money customers paid on average for one purchase, right? But if you're looking at collection of the numbers that you uh, accumulated over the course of one fiscal year, you probably wouldn't be able to even grasp uh, what's the average purchase, right, for, for one customer, for one transaction. Okay, so that's another example. Statistical anxiety, right, or anxiety in, in each course pretty much. Um, every student, or I was a student at one point in time, I remember how it is. Uh, you take exams, you submit homeworks, you take the final exam, and the big question is what grade you're going to get at the end, right? So uh, over the course of several years that I was teaching this course, I accumulated certain, well, data, right? Every student that ever was in this class uh, received a grade or, well, score at the end of the semester, and that's how I define the grade. I look at the score, right, at the end of the semester. So, uh, of course, nobody can predict, you know, who will get what at the end of the semester. It depends on a lot of factors, right? Uh, like your amount of efforts, how difficult is the material, how much time you dedicate to the studying. Maybe, you know, on the day of the exam you didn't have enough sleep, so therefore you made, like, some simple mistakes. Things like that can affect the performance, right? But uh, what uh, the instructor can provide is just basically a list of grades, right? That would be not very historical grades. What I gave out as grades historically, right, in this class for all students. That's probably not very informative, right? You're looking at, well, I'm assuming maybe in the, in the course of the last, you know, 10, 12 years, I, I've taught 500, 700 students, right? So if I give you 500 scores, that's just a bunch of numbers, right? That's data, okay? Uh, alternatively, I can tell you that historically, for example, I had 15% of A's, 25% of B's, you know, 20% uh, of C's, etc., etc. right? So that, that will give you some sort of the idea of what can you expect, with what probability you're going to get an A or B or C in this class, right? Uh, class average also probably would help, right? So what, what was the class average historically? Okay. All right, so let's discuss uh, two concepts that we're going to emphasize over and over and over again. Population versus sample. Population, when I say the word population, uh, typically what does that mean, population? When we hear population, what, what's the first thing that comes to the mind? Everyone. Everyone, right? We're talking about people living in a certain area, right? Such as population of the United States is how much approximately? 320 million approximately, right? Uh, population of Japan is approximately, I believe, 140, 150 million, right? Which is amazing, actually, because the area is really small, but the population is relatively high, right? So typically, when we mean uh, when we say population, we mean people living in a certain area. Population of Newport News, state of Virginia, United States, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, in statistics. Uh, the idea behind the word population is a little bit more broad, okay? When we say population in statistics, what we typically mean is all things that are of interest for us. And that can be anything, okay? Sure, it can be population in terms of humans living in a certain geographical area, but uh, it can be also all people who uh, came to, to the voting on the election day, okay? And that's not everybody who lives in the state, right? Because there are people... Uh, who are under the voting age, right, under the age of 18, they can't vote. There are people who are not U.S. citizens, just like myself, for example, I can't vote, okay, on the American elections. Uh, so population of voters is different from the population of humans living in the area, right? But it's not even necessarily about humans. Uh, for example, if I want to find out what's the safety rating on the Toyota Corolla, Okay, so in the head-on collision, for example, uh, the car is supposed to deploy the airbags, right? That's the decent thing to do. Uh, now, <laughs> question, uh, true or false? Every time when there is a severe head-on collision, the airbags deploy 100% of the times. False, right? Why? Because 
there is sensor involved, okay? And hardware does not uh, always work the way it was supposed to work, okay? So therefore, um, we would like, you know, the sensor to be sensitive enough, right, to sense every collision that's worthy of deploying the airbags, but unfortunately that doesn't happen 100% of the time. So how can I find out uh, what's the s uh, real safety rating on the, on, on the airbag? Well, I can take all production, right, all the Toyota Camrys that Toyota makes and crash them, okay? Do the crash test on them. So all my production is the population, right? Every single item that I manufactured is my population. If I crash all the cars, I'll find out exactly in what percentage of cases the airbags deploy. Is that very practical? Probably not, right? So uh, therefore, uh, instead of uh, using the population, statisticians oftentimes use a sample, okay? Sample is just a subset of the population, right? Uh, so, for example, uh, I can certainly uh, try to find out, you know, as, as accurately as I can in what percentage of cases the airbags deploy, but I know that it's not practical to crash all the cars. So I can go ahead and take 200 cars, right, crash them, and then ca calculate from these 200 cars in what percentage of cases the airbag actually deploys. And I will use that percentage as an estimate. That's not going to be an accurate number down to the last decimal, right? But I can use that as an, as an estimate of what is the you know, rating of the safety on Toyota Corolla. So oftentimes, statisticians, instead of using population, whoopsie, hold on, instead of using population, they use sample. A small, typically it's a small subset uh, of, the, of the actual population. Uh, also, it's kind of a good example actually to talk about uh, voting. Uh, so on the day of the election, when uh, all people who decide to go and vote, they cast their votes at the voting booths, right? Um, and at the end of the day, when we compute, uh, calculate all the votes that were casted for Republican candidate and for the Democratic candidate, then we know who won the state, right? Who won the state of Virginia, you know, Washington DC, Maryland, etc., etc. But uh, you probably remember it was just recent, right? Um, during the day, there is a uh, coverage, all day long coverage on the network television, right? And uh, they have updates, periodic updates, every like 15 minutes or half an hour that it looks like in Virginia the Republican candidate is winning, then half an hour later, well, it looks like now Democratic candidate is winning. So what do they do, the TV stations? Well, they uh, do something that's called exit polls, right? So what, what's an exit poll? They're basically asking some people who, are, who voted already, and they're coming out of the voting booths, right? Uh, who did you vote for, Republican or Democratic candidate, okay? So they don't ask everybody. So therefore, from that standpoint, they're getting a sample, right? And this sample is not very huge, actually. So if, let's say, 5 million people living in the state of Virginia, and let's say 80% of them are eligible to vote, then we're talking about several million voters, right? In actuality, the, the voting... Uh, uh, exit polls, uh, they typically are ran in terms of several thousand people. So several million voters that decide who won the state. Uh, and the network television companies during the election coverage, they actually base their projections on several thousand, not, not millions, but thousands of people that they uh, choose to poll okay, at the exit. So therefore, samples typically are much, much smaller than the entire population, okay? And they're used by statisticians to draw conclusions about the entire population. Now, of course, uh, because you're making conclusions based on incomplete information, that means what? That your conclusions are not necessarily 100% guaranteed, right? You lose uh, data, therefore you're missing substantially actually part of your population, so therefore your conclusions are not 100% guaranteed. And that's kind of statistical disclaimer. Every time when we're going to run the tests, we're going to say that, hey, at a certain percent confidence level, we can state this, okay? That doesn't mean that this is exact, uh, uh, exact statement. We still can be wrong, okay? So therefore, uh, if we choose to, to move from population to the sample, we gain simplicity in a sense, right? We don't have to deal with uh, millions and millions potential of observations. We can collect a much smaller set, okay? So therefore, it's cheaper, it's quicker, it's more practical. But the downside, of course, is we don't have the complete information, so our conclusions are not 100% guaranteed, okay? So that's the trade-off that we're consciously going to make.
All right. Now let's talk about parameters and statistics. What are they and what's the difference? Okay. Parameter is something that describes the population. All right there, it says a descriptive measure of population. Uh, for example, how many people live in the city of Newport News? Any estimations? Ballpark. About 160,000. Yep. Uh, and uh, if I want to find out what's the average income in the city of Newport News, what do I have to do? Like exact average income down to the last decimal cent. What do you think? You have to ask exactly, right? I have to uh, ask every one of 160,000 people how much money they're making, right? So after that, let's say that I do that. And let's say that they all tell me exactly how much money they're making. Nobody you know, lies to me. Uh, they all disclose their income, which is highly unlikely, right? But let's say I got that luck, okay? I collected 160,000 uh, numbers. And I can compute the very simple arithmetical average, and that's going to be the mean income in the city of Newport News, right? So that would be a parameter, something that I compute about the entire population. Uh, now, the, um, what we just discussed is uh, statisticians oftentimes cannot go for the entire population, right? Because it's large, it's impractical, it's very costly and time consuming to get the entire population data. So therefore, they settle for a sample, okay? Sample, we, we can apply pretty much the same formulas to the sample and compute something from the sample. So instead of polling 160,000 people in the city of Newport News, I can choose 2,000 only, okay? So very small percentage of people living in Newport News. And from these uh, 2,000 people, well, let's say I ask them the same question, how much money you make? They all tell me. No lies, nobody you know, uh, holds information back from me, so I get 2,000 observations uh, honest and, and exact, right? So I can compute the same, using the same formula, average for the sample. Now, here is the question. Is it going to be exactly the same uh, number as for the entire city, or maybe it's going to be different? What do you think? Patrick, what do you think? It's probably going to be different, right? Because I'm missing, actually, the majority of my observations, right? If out of 160,000, I get only two, I'm actually missing 158,000 numbers. If I add them to, uh, to, to my sample, of course, it will move the needle, right? Uh, it will change the result of my computation. So therefore, uh, parameter is something that characterizes the population. Statistic is exactly the same formula, but characterizes the sample. And typically, they're not the same, okay? So what I can compute from the sample is different from what I can compute if I know the population data, okay? Uh, now, uh, there at the bottom it says descriptive measure, right? Parameter is a descriptive measure of population. Statistic is a descriptive measure of a sample. What's a descriptive measure? Something that describes the data, that tells me summary of the data, right? It can be average, it can be range, it can be standard deviation, it can be coefficient of variability, can be different percentiles that I compute, 25th, 50th, 75th percentile, right? Some numbers that I can compute about the population, okay? And uh, same, by the way, applies to uh, things that are non-numerical, that are not measured in numbers. For example, um, if I poll, if I, if I run the exit poll during the election times, right? I poll 2,000 people, out of them, let's say, uh, 1,000, and 95 voted for Republican, and the rest of them, what, 905 voted for a Democratic candidate, right? I can compute what percentage of my sample voted for Republican, and what percentage voted for Democrat, that would be statistic, right? Because I'm taking only 2,000 people, okay? But when, once I collect all 3.5 million votes for the entire state, then I know exactly what happened in the entire population. So I'm talking about parameter now, right? Okay. So, um, oops. Populations have, right there at the bottom, populations have parameters, right? And samples have statistics, right? Statistics is something that you can compute for the sample. Population, same formula, 
but you get uh, something that's called a parameter, okay? And sample is a subset of the population. Okay, uh, so this course is actually uh, split into two subsets, okay? Unequal subsets. First, for the, for the first several days, we're going to talk about descriptive statistic. Okay, descriptive comes from the word describe, right? Describe means what? Here is the data, tell me a summary about that data. Okay, summarize this data, potentially big data set, with just a handful of uh, numbers for me, okay? Uh, and the rest of the semester, we're going to spend talking about inferential statistics. Inferential actually is a bigger set, and it's more powerful, and it's uh, more, more used, well, I shouldn't say more used, uh, it's certainly more difficult than, uh, than the descriptive statistics, okay? So in the inferential statistic comes from the word inference, right? Inference means drive the conclusion, right? Make some conclusions. So that's uh, the part where we're going to analyze samples and make conclusions about bigger populations, okay? From the sample information, we will somehow uh, make conclusions about the bigger, bigger whole data set, okay? So, and these parts are unequal. Uh, descriptive statistics is typically, they're very straightforward, so we shouldn't spend too much time on, uh, on them. But inferential part is the, the more challenging, so that's where the majority of time is going to be spent, okay? So that's how the course is organized. All right, so first thing that we're going to start talking actually today, uh, uh, well, today we're going to start descriptive statistics. The first thing uh, that we will uh, talk about are graphical techniques, and then tomorrow probably we're going to move to numerical techniques, okay? So graphical techniques, uh, we're humans, right? We're visual animals. So visual means what? A picture is worth thousands of words, right? That's the rule of thumb. Uh, and therefore, uh, when, when we look at the data set, it's much easier for us to get information out of the, out of the picture than a bunch of numbers, collection of numbers, okay? So graphical techniques that we're going to look at are the ways how you can organize uh, and represent data in form of charts, graphs, histograms, lines, trends, etc., etc. okay? Uh, and then uh, later on, when we're going to move to numerical techniques, uh, that's when we're going to talk about uh, uh, descriptive numbers, about the sample or the population. Formulas are pretty much the same. Uh, it doesn't, formula doesn't really care how, how large of the sample you have. You have big sample, small sample, the whole population. Uh, formulas practically don't change, except for standard deviation. I believe standard deviation... Uh, well, there, is, there is a subtle difference for the sample as compared to the population. But means, um, coefficient of variations, how you compute percentiles, it's pretty much the same, okay? And uh, when we talk about uh, descriptive of me measures of uh, uh, numerical techniques, that, that's where we're going to talk about three things, really. Okay, uh, measures of central location, that would be mean, mode, and median. You probably remember them from Math 125. And another side of the descriptive statistics, numerical descriptive statistics, is variability. Okay, it's not enough to say where is the center of your data. We have to say also how far to the left and to the right data is being spread. If it's spread too much, that's high variability. Typically, it's not a very good thing, right? If it's pretty much concentrated around the mean, that means that the variability is very small and data, or data points are close together. And uh, the third thing that we're going to talk about are different percentiles, measures of relative standing, okay? So that's just a preview of what's coming. All right, uh, so then we're going to move on to the inferential statistics, okay? Inferential statistics, uh, methods, they're more advanced and more difficult than descriptive statistics. Descriptive is just, here's the data set, describe it for me, please. Give me a picture, give me a numerical summary, tell me how variable it is, tell me where the 25th percentile is located, etc., etc., right? So that's fairly straightforward. Inferential statistics is more involved. Like I, uh, I said uh, before, it's about uh, taking the sample and from the sample driving the conclusion about the bigger data set, the population, right? So, uh, therefore, uh, what we're going to do is try to estimate the parameter of the population based on the statistic that you compute from the sample, okay? So, for example, let's say uh, the actual mean salary in the city of Newport News, which I don't know and nobody, I believe, knows accurately, is, um, let's say, $45,000, okay? 
But I take the sample, and from the sample I compute $43,500, okay? So I know that this is a sample, of course, right? So therefore my average probably is not exact. Uh, that applies to the entire 160,000 people living in the city of New Britain, right? But can I get an estimate? For example, can I get boundaries, right? That, hey, on average from the sample I got 43,500, but uh, if I, around this number, if I uh, compute upper and lower boundary and say, I don't know the actual mean, but it's somewhere between number A and number B, okay? So that would be an example of how we use inferential statistics. So from the sample, drive conclusion about the bigger data set that we don't get, actually. We don't have it, but we, we try to still make some conclusions uh, about what, uh, what might be the actual average in the city of Newport News if we take everybody, okay? Uh, if we poll every single person. All right, so uh, inferential statistics allows to study small part of the population, that would be sample, and still drive the conclusion about that bigger whole population data set, okay? All right, so uh, the process is very simple, right? So here is my population, and I know it has parameters, but parameters I likely will never going, I, I'm never going to get them, right? So I get a sample, I compute the sample mean, or sample standard deviation, or sample proportion, depending on what data I have, and then from this sample, I make a conclusion about the parameter, okay? So we, we use the sample statistic in order to estimate the parameter of the population. Okay. All right. So uh, we kind of discussed this already, right? Why do we need that? Because first of all, um, it, it can be impractical, right? So uh, several reasons why statisticians go for the entire, for the sample as opposed to the entire population. Reason number one, uh, it's expensive to get this information, right? So let's say, for example, I, I want to get every single salary in the city of Newport News. Let's say I set out to get this data set for myself, 160,000 numbers, okay? How many people am I going to need to hire to collect all this data for me? A lot, right? Is it going to take them a long time or short time to get this information, the data? A long time, right? So therefore it's expensive, right? If you decide to go for the sample or for the population data, it's expensive typically, okay? It's very time consuming. Uh, Let's say I have enormous amounts of money and I have all time in the world that I have, uh, uh, that, that, I, that I can have, right? Uh, true or false, they're going to ask 160,000 people and every single person will honestly tell them how much money they're making. No, right? So even if I forget about the time factor, forget about the cost factor, still there is such thing that I cannot get you know, every single answer because some people will tell me take a hike, right? I'm not telling you, who are you? Who ask me this deeply personal question, right? Uh, uh, yeah, might shoot me too, who knows? So, uh, and, and another uh, reason why uh, oftentimes statisticians do not go for the population data is practical consideration. Just like in our previous example with Toyota Camry, right, or Corolla. If I want to know in what percentage of cases the airbag deploys, I need to destroy all production, right? And after that, well, congratulations, you destroyed all of your cars, you have nothing more to sell, right? But now you know exactly in what percentage of cases the airbag deploys. It's not practical, of course, right? So four, uh, four considerations, right? Number one, they're expensive. Number two, they're time consuming. Number three, some people will lie to me or simply say, I'm not, I'm not telling, right? I can't get it. Uh, all the data and impractical, right, practicality, okay? Now, let's discuss uh, confidence level and significance level. We're going to go back to this, so for now I'm just going to sketch it out, okay? Remember I told you uh, a few minutes ago that uh, we take sample, we draft conclusions about the bigger population, right? But the price that we pay is these conclusions are not going to be 100% accurate statement, right? So we have to characterize accuracy of our conclusion somehow. So statisticians introduce two measures, okay? One of them is called significance level. We use Greek letter alpha for that. And the other is confidence level. Well, one minus alpha. Alpha is fraction of one, right? Between zero and one. So uh, confidence level probably is simpler to understand. When I say I'm 95% confident, confidence means how sure I am about my answer. Simple as that, right? So my confidence uh, level is percentage of time 
one possible interpretation of confidence uh, level is percentage of times when my conclusions about the population based on sample analysis will yield correct results. So percentage of time when I am actually correct. Okay? Uh, significance level is kind of uh, opposite of that, percentage of time when I'm wrong. Okay, that's why if you add together confidence level 1 minus alpha and significance level alpha, you get 100%. Because percentage of time when I'm wrong plus percentage of times when I'm right should give me everything, right? 100%. Okay? All right. Uh, the standard value for the confidence uh, level in statistics is 95%. So therefore, standard level of, conf of significance is 5%, right? That's not the only combination that statisticians are using. That's kind of default one. So if you're running some test and nothing in the problem tells you what confidence or significance level to use, you can safely assume that it's 95% confidence and 5% significance. But that's considered to be a normal test. Sometimes a uh, test is more strict, more rigorous, okay? So in other words, I want to be more confident. So more rigorous test uh, for more rigorous tests, statisticians are using 99% confidence and only 1% significance. So I want to run rigorous tests so that there is only 1% chance that I'm actually making the wrong conclusion. Okay? Other way around is also possible. Okay? So if I want to, uh, to run not so strict test, kind of uh, soft test, right? uh, then I can use 90% confidence and 10% significance. But like I said, standard thing is 95% and 5%. Uh, for the significance, okay? And that just basically summarizes what I just said. 95 and 5% are standard things. More strict test runs at 1% significance, 99 confidence. More uh, soft test runs at 90% confidence and 10% significance. Okay, so let's do some quick, <coughs> excuse me, some, some quick practice problem. A manufacturer of computer chips says that less than 10% of chips <coughs> produced daily are defective. Uh, so at the end of the day, they take 1,000 chips out of their entire daily production and test them comprehensively, run all kinds of tests on them, okay? And they find that out of these 1,000 chips that they uh, tested, 75 failed the test, therefore they found to be defective, okay? So question eight. In this problem, what do we mean by population? What's our population of interest? Remember, population is everything that we want to know about certain subject matter, right? So what's the population here? All the computer chips produced daily, right? Exactly. So however many we produce daily, it can be 20,000 or it can be 50,000, that's my population of interest, right? My daily, entire daily production. What's the sample? 1,000 that I'm looking at, right? So I'm taking only a small fraction of what I produce daily, and that's the part that I investigate, right, in details. Everything else is gray unknown to me, okay? What's the parameter in this problem? What's the thing that I want to know about my daily production? Oh, uh, what is I mean... Uh-huh, what percentage, right? I'm looking at percentage, right, in this problem, because chip, chip is kind of a binary deal, right? It's either good or defective. There can be a lot of different things that are wrong, but at least, at least one thing is wrong, and we immediately label that as a defective, right? It can be, like, in the middle, like, partially good, right? It's either yes or no kind of thing, okay? So, therefore, out of every daily production, uh, out of the entire daily production, I want to compute what is, what is the actual percentage of defective chips, right? So that's, that's my parameter that characterizes my entire daily production number, okay? And what's the statistic? Actually, statistic we can compute, right? Uh, the, the parameter we don't know, right? Whatever this X percent of chips out of whatever we produce daily defective is a big mystery to us, right? But we did take a sample, and sample in sample we can tell actually, right? What's the statistic for the sample? So we took 1,000 chips, right? Tested them all comprehensively. 75 were found to be defective, right? So what's the percentage in the sample? 75 out of 1,000, right? How much is that? 
less than 10%, 7.5 more specific, right? 7.5% is my statistic, right? I have a sample of 1,000, and for this sample, 7.5% were defective. That's my statistic, okay? So, does this claim, uh, does the claim of the manufacturer appear to be true or false? Appears to be true, right? So, because 7.5 is certainly less than 10, and that's what they say, right? The percentage in the entire daily production is less than 10. Whatever it is, I don't know, but it's less than 10. I found in my sample it to be 7.5, so it certainly looks like it's true. But here is uh, the deal about statistics. Don't believe your eyes, okay? And we will see actually in, in uh, later uh, when we get to the hypothesis testing and confidence interval material, we'll see that even though based on the sample statistic it may seem like a true statement, in actuality we can't make this conclusion because, again, this is just a sample, right? It can be just a random flick. In other words, if I take other sample of 1,000 chips, and I, of course, it's going to be a different number of defective chips, right, in this production. Uh, and I compute the new percentage of defective chips, it's going to be a different number, and I will, uh, we'll, 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 we'll draw a different conclusion from that, okay? So I can't really make this statement based on just 7.5 that I computed from the sample, okay? So later we will see a couple of examples uh, that emphasize this point. Okay. All right. So uh, software for class we everybody installed it, right? Patrick, did you install it? Okay. Is it still still installing? Still running? Okay. So software for class. <coughs> let me tell you really quickly. Jump, JMP. I just just pronounced jump. Okay. Stands for John's Macintosh Project. So it was started in 19. 89 by a guy named John. I actually forgot what was his last name. Uh, and uh, it, it meant to be actually a statistical package from, from the get-go. So over the years, as they built more and more features into the product, it became more and more powerful. And uh, SAS is actually kind of our neighbor, right, in North Carolina. Uh, in Gary, North Carolina. It's called Statistical Analysis Systems Incorporated. That's a for-profit organization that uh, makes SAS software, which is one of the most popular packages, actually, that's used in the industry for statistical analysis. So Jump, basically, at some point in time, they started to introduce more and more features to become more and more integrated into SAS. So in 2009, SAS made the decision to buy Jump, and now it's part of the Jump. Of, of SAS. So it's kind of a little bit weird arrangement as far as uh, I can tell because SAS is a very powerful and expensive, of course, statistical package which does statistical analysis. Jump does a lot of same things actually that SAS does. So they have kind of two products competing almost, products that are being run simultaneously, that are being sold, commercial products, right? So SAS is more popular, that's what I'm kind of trying to say. SAS is more popular in, in the industry than Jump. That's not to say that Jump uh, is not popular at all. There are some companies that use Jump, like, for example, Shipyard, I know, uses Jump. Not for all applications, but for some of them. Uh, so we're going to use Jump, and uh, let's kind of end this uh, part of the, uh, of the fir first lecture, and we'll continue with the second part after we take a break. Okay? All right, so welcome to part number two, ladies and gentlemen, of our course. And um, in this part, we're going to discuss how to make a picture uh, of a data. So graphical and tabular descriptive techniques. Now remember, in the previous uh, part, we discussed that statistics as a subject matter consists of two unequal parts, right? Inferential statistics, which is a bigger part, we're going to dedicate most of the time to that subject, uh, and uh, descriptive statistics. So this uh, chapter two, and by the way, chapter two, it refers, uh, like it's a weird thing, right? We don't have a textbook, so what, what's the chapter two? It's the chapter two from the Keller textbook that is optional, right? That you can buy really cheaply on Amazon, older edition, right? Not the current one, okay? So it's chapter two from the Keller. So, uh, graphical and tabular descriptive techniques. Okay, so reminder, what we just discussed in the previous class, uh, statisticians' holy grail is having access to the population data, right? That's basically the 
biggest biggest thing that you can get in statistics, the population data. Unfortunately, oftentimes that's not the case. We have to settle for the sample, right? Now, these techniques that we're going to discuss, graphical and tabular techniques, they apply equally to both population or sample, okay? So it doesn't matter if you have a big data set, if it's everything, or it's a small subset on a couple of thousand rows, a couple of hundred rows, if it's just a small sample. So uh, the formulas, the methods of uh, making a picture, summarizing that in the table are essentially the same. By the way, before we begin, I wanted to point out that statistics is kind of an evolving area right now, okay? Um, how long, let me ask you the philosophical question, how long as the humanity we had computers at our disposal? In other words, when the computers were invented. Nineteen forties, exactly. Yep, nineteen forties is when we had these gigantic, awkward, bulky machines, right? That occupied the entire room. They were very expensive, right? They were slow by our today's standards. Of course, back then they didn't think that, right? That way. But uh, we, as a humanity, we have computers for about sixty, maybe seventy years, right? Um, and um, computers, uh, I don't have to tell you, they are evolving very rapidly, right? So, for example, my cell phone is a computer. I don't think of that as a cell phone. That's a computer. Why? Because it can connect to the network, right? So it has an IP address. I can receive and send email. I have installed on mine, for example, uh, a Word. So I can type Word document. I can open Word document, PowerPoint, Excel. So that I can browse internet. So typical things that a computer can do, your cell phone can do, okay? So... Uh, what does that mean in terms of statistics, right? So how is that relevant for statistics? Well, this slide basically tells you that population is the holy grail, is the golden you know, target, right? And if we have population, then we know everything pretty much about certain subject matter, right? Uh, and historically, it was not the case that we, we didn't have access to the populations, right? So therefore, you have to settle for small, a small sample. Well, with a uh, proliferation of computers, where uh, computers are everywhere in our life, more and more companies find themselves in the position that actually they don't have to settle for the sample because they do have population data, okay? For example, Walmart. <laughs> when Walmart, uh, uh, when, when you're buying something at Walmart and you scan that something through the checkout counter, this thing beeps, right? So what does that mean, this sound, the beep? The beep means that it understands that you're buying a, you know, head and shoulders shampoo from them and, you know, two pounds of bananas and uh, one gallon of milk, etc., etc. And it, it records all this data into the database. So Walmart doesn't have to guess, you know, what's the average uh, purchase from one customer. They actually have all of that information stored at any point in time in their internal database. So if they do want to find out the average amount of sale per customer, they can know that with 100% accuracy. Why? Because they have access to the population. All the sales that they have accumulated in the course of a year, they have them actually. It's all recorded, okay? Uh, Google, for example, uh, in another way, right? Uh, to look at that, Google. Everything, uh, Google does not just accumulate data about websites, right? That's, of course, what they're known for, right? That's what they do the best. They know everything on the public access web, right? So if the website <coughs> can be accessed from any IP address, if it's open in the public domain, then Google knows about that. They, they found it, right? Uh, they also keep track of uh, queries. Every time when you run a query against Google, you're searching for statistics textbook, okay? Or what are the flu symptoms? Or, you know, what's the capital of uh, Argentina, right? Google knows what you're looking for. And therefore, all these several billion searches that they process on a daily basis, they know precisely what people are looking for. They can uh, create all kinds of summaries from that, right? So from that standpoint, they know everything. They know 100%, well, this portion of the market that they control, right, which is more than 50%. So uh, especially technology-oriented companies or companies that actively using technology, they don't need to settle for the sample, they actually have the population data. So computers, they enable statisticians essentially to move from the sample analysis 
back into the population analysis. So that becomes more and more true as computers become more and more uh, popular and more and more widespread in the society. And it's not just computers. A lot of data comes from things like sensors, right? Uh, for example, how do you predict the weather? Well, you just plant a lot of sensors on the ground, right? And these sensors measure temperature, humidity, uh, atmospheric pressure, you know, uh, speed of wind, direction of the wind, right? And they periodically take these measurements and record them into the database. And after that, you have, well, it's still a sample of the weather, right? Kind of, but it's very detailed sample. So uh, the more uh, and more computers and sensors we use in our life, the more and more we're talking about actually population data rather than sample. Well, anyhow, that was kind of poetic part, okay? So let's, <laughs> let's now move on and discuss um, more specifically statistical concepts, okay? Uh, so some definitions that we're going to use during this course. Variable. Variable uh, comes from the word to vary, right? Something that varies. Okay? Variable is anything that we measure in statistics. For example, we can, like, there are only a few of us here, right? Uh, what, six people in this room, so not a lot. Uh, but we can still measure, for example, our height, right? How high are we? I'm five foot seven, for example, okay? That's probably average or maybe below average. Uh, but uh, if we measure every, every single person in this room or go outside and start measuring people out of the blue, you know, people will be freaked out, of course, about that, right? A bunch of people measuring <laughs> weights of complete strangers. We're going to get different measurements for every person, right? Same thing about, uh, about the weight, right? Or blood pressure or the pulse or amount of money that people are making, right? or number of years of education that people have, including high school and university, right? So all these things are different from one person to another person. So therefore, all of them are variables, okay? So we're going to use letters such as X, Y, Z to denote variables. Variable is something that varies, right? And each variable has um, a range of possibilities, possible range. For example, one variable is a grade that I assign in any of my classes, right? And grade is based on the course score. If person scored 85, that's going to be a grade of B. If person scored 93, that's going to be A, right? Um, so the final score that people learn in the class can be zero if you didn't attend single class, didn't submit single homework or exam, right? Or it can be 100 uh, when you attended every class, submitted every assignment and did it perfectly, right? And all possibilities in between are also possible. So therefore, for the course score variable, and it's a variable because from student to student is going to be a different number, right? I compute course uh, scores at the end of the semester. Not, not a single couple of students receive exactly the same score. Everybody is different, right? But we know that they're all in between, between zero and one. So that's the range of the, that the variable can take, right? Data, on the other hand, um, I mean, even if I have a very big class, it's not that I'm going to get every single possible value of the grade or, or course score, right? So, for example, let's say I run the moderately sized class, well, small rather, right? And I get 67, 71, 74, 83, 93, 55, and 48. These are specific values or data points that I observed in that specific class, right? So my variable takes certain set of specific numbers. So data are actually plural. So the word data is a noun and it's plural. Data means many data points, okay? So one data point is called datum. So datum is single, data are plural, okay? All right, now, this part is important, okay? This is pretty much answering the very first question on your uh, decision tree, right? In, in using this flow chart, trying to decide which test to use. That's the very first question that comes up. If you're comparing two populations or three or more populations or uh, analyzing relationship, the very first question is, what's the data type? So in statistics, we're going to discuss in general three data types. Well, let's actually take it one step at a time. Okay, let's take it slow. So data can take two different forms, okay? It can be numerical or it can be categorical. So what's numerical? Numerical, uh, well, you, you can hear the word, right? N numerical means a bunch of numbers, right? Uh, another way how numerical data type is called, uh, sometimes it's called also continuous, and that's what actually Jump is using. 
Jump uh, calls the uh, numerical data type continuous uh, variable, continuous data type. Sometimes it's also called quantitative from the word quantity, of course, right? And sometimes it's also called interval. Now, uh, interval is a little bit weird, right? What? Why is it interval? Well, the reason probably is uh, if the data uh, data type is, is numerical, then I can take two data points and compute the distance between them. In other words, interval, right? And make sense out of that. For example, let's say I'm making $40,000 and Seal is making $50,000, okay? So therefore, I can subtract his salary, my salary from his, and the difference is 10, and I can say, hey, Phil is making $10,000 more than me, right? So the interval or distance between these two observations makes sense, okay? Categorical, not the case. Categorical means that uh, the data that we're collecting is not numbers, typical, okay? For example, male versus female, okay? Every person uh, is either male or female, right? So you can imagine two boxes, right? And every observation that you get goes into one box or another box, okay? And I can actually uh, assign numbers to the categories, and that's what we're going to do essentially, okay? Uh, like, for example, I can encode male as one and female as two, okay? But if I take two observations and make the difference, if there is one person female, that's two, another person is male, it's one, two minus one is one, how do I interpret? The distance between male and female is one. What does that mean? It doesn't make any, any sense, right? So therefore, uh, that's probably why uh, I'm guessing the numerical data sometimes called interval, because you can, com can compute the distance between two observations and make sense out of that and interpret that meaningfully. <laughs> yeah, in, in between, right? <laughs> Actually, we're going to get <laughs> we're going to get to the example where uh, it's like four four different. Well, we're going to get to that in just one second. Oh, I still have SPSS because I used SPSS in the previous class. So that should be jump, and that should not be scale, that should be continuous. <coughs> okay, uh, now categorical data has two flavors, actually. Okay? Categorical data can be nominal, nominal or ordinal. Difference, well, these are actually very similar data types, nominal and ordinal. Uh, difference between them is that nominal data is just a bunch of categories that don't have any specific order. Okay? And ordinal data is a bunch of categories that are ordered from best, to the worst or from highest to the lowest. So they have some natural order touched to them. So let's get specific about every one. So we have three different data types, right? There is interval or continuous or numerical data type, and there is nominal and there is ordinal. So let's talk about every single one of them. Okay, interval data, like I said, can be called numerical, quantitative jump calls it continuous. Okay? Interval data is highly privileged. That means that we can do all kinds of computations and transformations with numerical or continuous data, okay? Simple, obvious ones are average, right? We can, like, for example, if we measure the height of every person in the room, then we can find the average height. And we can interpret that. It will make sense for us, right? You can find the range. We can find the shortest person in the room. That's probably going to be me. We can find the tallest person in the room. That's probably going to be Patrick, right? Uh, and we can find the different distance between Patrick and me, and that would be the range, right? That would be uh, how far away are the most extreme observations, right? Uh, you can compute standard deviation, coefficient of variability, variance, all kinds of different computations are permitted. So from that standpoint, interval data is very highly privileged. We can do all kinds of computations on that, okay? All right, so now nominal data. It kind of occupies the different end of the spectrum. If interval data, or continuous, let's call it continuous. Continuous data is highly privileged. Nominal data is highly underprivileged, okay? Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, that means that practically no computations are allowed on the nominal data. The only thing that we can compute for the nominal data is count how many observations fall into each category, and then after that we can compute percentages, okay? Uh, and again, I have to change that, right? It still says SPSS, something that I didn't catch yesterday. I was changing my slides, didn't quite catch it. So for example, uh, marital status. 
right? Can be four things, right? It can be either single or married or divorced or widowed. That's probably it, right? So if we go outside and meet people on the street and again start weirdly asking them that question, right, out of the blue, what's the marital status, they will tell us, uh, I'm married, I'm divorced, I'm single, I'm married, etc., etc., and we can actually write them down, right? So we can start, like, on the piece of paper even, right? So I'm going to record every time when I get an answer from a person, I'm going to write it down. So literally, I'm going to have a bunch of different answers, right? So single, married, single, married, divorced, married, single, etc., etc., okay? Uh, another way to do that is assign uh, numbers <laughs> to my categories, okay? So, for example, this is one way, just like uh, it says on my slide. <coughs> Every time when I hear the response, the response single, I will write down number one. And of course, I will remember that one means single, right? Every time when a uh, person says uh, they're married, that's a two. Divorced is three, and widowed is four, okay? Now, uh, these categories are not ordered, right? There is no way to tell which one is best, right? To be single, or married, or, you know, divorced. No way to tell which one is best, which one is worst, which one is in the middle. So therefore, we're dealing with nominal data, okay? Now, um, here is the reason why nominal data is highly underprivileged. Let's say that I will get uh, two people, very small sample, okay? Uh, uh, and one person is, uh, let's see, uh, let's say one, one person is divorced, another person is single, right? So, according to my labels, I will record them as 1 and 3, right? And then, let's say I want to compute the average in my sample. So, 3 plus 1 divided by 2 equals 4 divided by 2, 2, right? So, therefore, I have a single and a divorced person, but on average, everybody is married, right? Does it make sense? <laughs> no, right? So, therefore, uh, we can, of course, do the computations with the, with the numbers that we assign to different <laughs> categories, the challenge is interpretation, right? And that's especially uh, true given the fact that one, two, three, four that I assigned is just my choice, right? Can I assign different set of numbers? I can, right? I can call one 11, another 22, another 30, and another is 400, right? So what numbers I assign to categories is my choice. And therefore, every time when I compute the average, of course it's going to be different, right? If I use a different label, different numerical labels, my average is going to be different. So depending on my choice, the average will move up or down, right? That's not, that's not quite correct. That, that just doesn't feel right. So therefore, uh, nominal data, all computations that we were allowed to do on the continuous variable, such as height, amount of money, temperature outside, you know, uh, square footage of the building, salary measured in terms of dollars, everything that we measure, right, as a continuous variable, None of these computations, unfortunately, apply to the nominal data, okay? So therefore, nominal data is highly, highly underprivileged, okay? Now, also nominal data, just like ordinal as well, it's called categorical, if you remember, and also called qualitative, as opposed to quantitative, right? Continuous variables are quantitative because they're numbers or quantities, right? Here, we're not dealing with numbers, rather categories, right? So therefore, they're called qualitative, uh, qualitative data set. Okay, now ordinal data is, uh, idea is very similar to nominal, okay? It's still a bunch of categories. The difference is that ordinal data uh, are ordered. So in other words, my, my, ca my categories are ordered. Uh, customer service, okay? It's, it's actually a very popular data type when you're ranking something. Was that class good on a scale of one through 10? One being the worst, 10 being the best, okay? You stay at the hotel, when you check out, they give you this small card where it says, can you please finish the questionnaire, okay? How would you rank your stay with us today? On a scale from one to five, one being poor, two being fair, three okay, four good or very good, and five excellent. So again, I'm dealing with categories, right? So it's my subjective opinion about how I felt about myself and life in general when I was staying at this hotel, okay? Uh, so it's just a bunch of categories, but I can assign numbers to them, right? And again, if I'm using a simplistic way, then poor is one, fair is two, and excellent is five, okay? Difference is, even though these are categories, but fair is better than poor, right? And good is better than fair, and of course it's better than poor, right? 
And excellent is better than anything else. So therefore, my categories are actually aligned or ordered. Okay. So therefore, what I need to do when I am assigning uh, numbers to my categories, I need to follow the same order. So one, two, three, four, five would be one way to do that. But at the same time, here is another way, right? I can assign poor, fa uh, poor six, fair eighteen, good twenty-three, and then forty-five and excellent eighty-eight. So I'm keeping the order of my categories, but the numbering is completely different. And again, if I want to compute the average, average moves, right? Every time when I reassign numbers, keeping the order, my average takes completely different value. So therefore, just like for the nominal data, any computations for the ordinal data are disallowed. So from that standpoint, it is also highly, highly underprivileged data set, okay? I can compute the average, I cannot compute standard deviation, I cannot compute range. None of these beautiful things that I can compute about my continuous data type apply here. Okay? So nominal data and ordinal data are highly underprivileged. <coughs> but uh, ordinal data actually uh, has one more computation that I can, I can make compared to nominal data. Remember we discussed what kind of computations are allowed for nominal data. The only thing that I can do is uh, for example, let's go back to my previous example, nominal date, right? Single married, divorced widow. Let's say I go out there on the street, okay? And I take 100 people. We call it 100 people? A sample, right? And out of 100 people, let's say 56 will say that they're married, 23 will say that they're divorced, um, 15 will say that they're single, and the rest of them will say that they're widowed, okay? What can I do with my data? Well, one thing is I, I have four boxes, right? Four categories. I can say in box number one, married, I have 56 observations. So that's a count, okay? And by the way, out of these 100 people, that represents 56%, right? So I can compute the count or frequency, how many observations I have in box number one, and what percentage that frequency represents out of the entire sample, okay? And I can do the same thing with the rest of the categories, right? That's the only type of computation that I can do with nominal data. Just how many observations I have in each category and what percentage they represent, okay? N ordinal data, I can do the same type of computation because after all, it's just a bunch of categories, right? Same idea. Another thing that I can do with ordinal data is something that's called median, observation in the middle. Well, let's actually illustrate that, okay? How about, yeah, there we go. There you go. But I, I don't see it on the screen somehow. Okay. Hold on. All right. Let me use the, the mark. Okay. So, unfortunately, I cannot switch the screens to the, uh, to the one note. All right. So, let's say, well, with Patrick out of the room, there are five of us. That's actually good because five being odd number is good for, for median computations, right? So, uh, let me ask you this question. What do you think about the parking at CNU? Okay, so one being poor, two being fair, three being okay, average, four good, and five excellent. So, let's start with Phil. Horrible. Horrible. So, one or two? Two, two. okay. We have two. All right. Milan? Three? All right. Shen? Five. Shen likes that. Okay. Chris? Two. Two? All right. Well, I'm going to say four. Okay? So these are our responses, right? Very small data set. Two, three, five, uh, two, and four. So because it's an ordinal data, I can order that from smallest to highest, right? So two and two and then I have three, and then I have four, and then I have five. And uh, now my observation in the middle, or the median, is the one that separates 50% of data below that from 50% of data above that, right? And that would be observation in the position number three out of five numbers, right? Because two are below that number and two are above that number. So this is my median, okay? So based on these responses that we have collected from this small sample, the median observation for the parking conditions at CNU is 3, which means okay. Not too rosy, not too, uh, not too bad, right? Average, okay? 
So uh, that's the only extra, well, let's call it computation, right, that is allowed on the ordinal data as compared to the nominal data. Nominal data does not have this capability, right? Why? Because categories are not ordered, right? You can shuffle them around and you will get just the same set. While here, with the ordinal data, I can't shuffle them and I can't switch poor and fair, right? Because poor is the worst and fair is the next, next worst, right? Still be be better than poor. So, uh, Ordinal data is only slightly more privileged than nominal data, but there is not much really difference between these two, okay? All right, so, and that slide basically summarizes what I just said, okay? All calculations are permitted on interval data, so it's highly privileged data type, okay? No calculations are allowed for nominal data except counting how many observations fall into each category, <coughs> and maybe <coughs> calculating percentages or probabilities, relative frequencies, essentially it's the same thing, okay? For ordinal data, same thing applies as for the nominal uh, one, okay? So all I can do is count how many observations in each category and what are the percentages of frequencies, uh, relative frequencies or probabilities, plus I can compute observation in the middle, which is median, right? Separating higher half of the observation from lower half of the observation. So here is the slide that basically I put together a long, long time ago. Kind of hierarchy of data types, okay? On the top you have highly privileged interval or continuous data type, right? Everything, well, not everything, but a lot of different computations are allowed on the interval data. At the bottom you have least privileged nominal data, and in the middle you have ordinal data, but really ordinal data is not exactly in the middle. You still cannot perform the lion's share of, of things of computations that you can do with continuous data type, right? You still cannot do the averages or standard deviations or coefficients of variation or percentiles, none of that applies, right? So the, it only marginally more privileged compared to the nominal uh, data type because we can compute the median, right? And that's pretty much it. Okay, uh, so let's do the class exercise and then switch uh, over to jump and then let's, 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 let's do some uh, introduction to jump, okay? So, quickly. Uh, residents of condominium were recently surveyed and asked a series of questions. So, for each response, and each response, by the way, is a variable, right? Because from person to person, the response varies, so that's a variable. Okay? Uh, for each response, for each variable, identi identify the data type. What is your age? Some people say I'm 22, some people say I'm 35. So, what do you think? Which one is that? We have three choices, right? Nominal, ordinal, and continuous. Which one is that? Hmm? Nominal? The age. Interval. Interval. Continuous, right? It's a number, right? I'm 45, for example. Not quite. On Friday, I'm going to turn 45. <clears throat> so it's a number, right? I wish it could be nominal, and I could renumber that, right? So it's not 45, it's 19. I can't do that. <laughs> so <laughs> there is no going back. So that's a continuous uh, one, right? On what floor do you live? So somebody lives on the first floor, second floor, third floor, etc., etc. What do you think? Interval. Interval? E yes. Can it be? Uh, can we argue that this is an ordinal? Because I interval, for example, I live on the first floor. Uh, Patrick lives on the second floor. On average, it's 1.5. It's like. Harry Potter, right? Platform nine and three quarters, right? It's like weird thing that doesn't exist, right? 1.5, floor not 1.5. So average is probably not that interpretable, right? So I would say it's an ordinal data, okay? because we can't... So it's, it's, an, it's, it's an arguable question, actually. Uh, do we treat that as an ordinal data, or do we still treat that as interval and, and use that as a number? Because average is not quite interpretable, right? All right, do you own or rent? So, own number one, rent number two. And that's how we record them, one and two. What do you think? Nominal? Probably. Can it be ordinal? Because American dream is to own a house, right? To, to have your own house, right? So, therefore... It's universal truth that owning a house is definitely better than renting a house, true? Well, some people may argue, you know, 
if you're owning the house, what happens when your air conditioner breaks down? You're responsible for that, right? 10,000 bucks right there, okay? But if you're renting the house and your air conditioning breaks down, landlord pays that thing, right? Then you have to cut your own grass if you own, right? If you rent, nope, don't even need the uh, lawn mower. So it's not quite clear cut case, right? Some people may prefer renting, most people probably prefer owning, to be, to be fair, right? But still, it's not quite that clear-cut answer. So I'd say yes, it's, it's, it's nominal, right? And not ordinal. So owning the house is not definitely better than renting a house, right? There are people who think otherwise. Okay. How many square feet is in your residence? That is clearly what type. Interval. Continuous, right? Because it's measured in square feet, right? Okay. Does your residence have a pool on site? Yes or no? That one should be... Nominal also, right? But isn't that true that um, having a pool is definitely better than not having a pool? <laughs> not necessarily, right? Some people may complain, you know, these kids are always screaming, I can't sleep, what the heck? So therefore, most people probably like having a pool. Some people are indifferent and some people don't like it, right? So it's not clear-cut case, probably nominal. Yep. Uh, how many roommates do you live with? Zero, one, two, three. What do you think? Hmm? Interval. interval probably, yeah, interval, right? Uh, what is the color of your kitchen countertop? I have gray or black or blue or funky looking orange. Nominal, right? Yep, just colors, right? There is no natural ordering between them. Okay. How many months did you live in your current place? That would be... Hmm? Interval, right? Continuous. Because it's a number, just like age, right? Similar, similar deal. On the scale from 1 to 5, 5 being the best, 1 being the worst, rate your living experience in the condominium. That would be clearly ordinal, right? Just like we have with parking. Right? <coughs> and uh, do you think that parking space is adequate in your condominium, right? So, well, if, if, if the answer is yes and no, as opposed to 1 to 5, right? It's still, is it better to have good parking conditions as opposed to bad? Always yes, right? Nobody wants to live in a place that has bad parking conditions. So that probably is ordinal, right? Okay, good. Now let's, uh, let's do an exercise, actually, uh, in jump. Let's see if I can make jump show up. Well done. All right. No, I have to stop the recording here. And restart, restart it again with jump. Hold on. All right, welcome to part three of our class. All right, uh, so this is jump. That's what you see when you start uh, the program. So everybody has, has the program up and running, right? On your computer or, or on the uh, university computer. So uh, this is just a basic window, introductory window. And you can see that uh, the left part says recent files. Well, mine has a lot of different files. Yours probably has some files as well. Or is it clean? Clean. clean? OK. That means it wasn't used in a while. The last time these computers were used, um, Jump was used on these computers was probably about two or three weeks ago. So probably it's clean. So I'm fairly recent. So these are all things that I did in the past. Let's actually do the first thing, uh, just basic you know, navigation in Jump and how to enter the data. So in the previous couple of sections, lessons, we discussed that, you know, we can collect the data, right? We can go out on the street and we can start asking people questions, right? Such as, you know, what's your marital status? How much money are you making? How tall are you? All these things, right? Well, eventually you have to process them somehow and compute statistics from them, right? Remember, samples have statistics, populations have parameters, right? Since we're dealing with samples, we're going to compute sample statistics. So let's actually, uh, our first exercise is going to be how to enter data in Jump. Very basic, okay? So this is uh, what you see, okay? And let me just verify that we still, yep, we have recording going. Okay, so I'm going to start a new data table. It's the very first button up there, okay? So click on that and you will see a window for the data. Uh, looks uh, a lot like Excel, right? 
you have columns and you have rows. Okay, so let's actually do this thing. We have, what, six people here in this class, right? And about each person we have a name, uh, age, right? Uh, what else? Gender, right? Male and female. And let's, let's do this thing, right? Let's enter all this data about parking. So, in, the, in my first column, uh, first of all, I'm going to rename my first column. So, double click on the column one, on the heading, and uh, column number one, I'm going to call name, okay? And name, of course, is going to be not a numeric data type, but it's going to be a character, right? Character, okay? And the modeling, here I have options, right? Remember we discussed, we can have continuous, we can have ordinal, and we can have nominal, right? So continuous is disabled right now for me. Why? Because I picked character, right? Character cannot be a number. So therefore, jump knows not to do that. Uh -huh. um, what did you click to like, make the table? Uh, oh, uh, to, to make the table? Okay, hold on. Here, right? This, this button, new table, or you can go file, new, data table, same thing. Okay, thank you. Okay. So column one, I'm going to call name. And uh, data type, I'm going to pick character, and probably it's going to be nominal, right? So I'm going to just leave it at that. Okay, so name. All right, let's start with Patrick, right? Patrick. Okay. Uh, Chris, right? Chris. And then we have Phil. And then we have uh, Milan. Milan, how do you spell your name? M I. Milan, all right. And we have Shannon. And then we have Dimitri. Okay, cool. And you can see that uh, on my left side I have columns, right? So my first column is name. So every time when I create a new variable, essentially a variable is a column, right? In my data table. Okay, uh, every time when I have a new column in here, it's going to show up in the columns, and whatever title I'm going to give to that column, my variable, is going to show up here uh, as well. So the icon next to the column name is going to represent for me what data type is that. And look at that. If I click, right now it shows the red kind of bunch of bars, right? Uh, and that's basically the standard icon for the nominal data. So if I click on that one, you can see that it tells me, Hey, it can, it can be continuous, but again, it's disabled because, hey, characters cannot be continuous. It's not a number. Or it can be ordinal, or it can be nominal, or there is another option, none. Quite honestly, I don't... It, may, maybe because you, you have, for example, a column with just comments, right? That you're not supposed to analyze, it's just like for every entry, you have just some comments, so you don't want to treat that as a part of your data set, it's just some, you know, descriptions, notes that you leave behind. But that's probably why we have that. Okay. The next one, we're going to have age. Okay, so column number two, I'm going to double click and I'll change to age, okay? And data type is numeric and modeling type is continuous, right? So I'm going to leave it as is, okay? Numeric and continuous. And when I click OK, look at that. Immediately, it adds another name to the list of columns and the icon is different. Now it's a blue triangle. Blue triangle is the standard icon for continuous or interval numerical data type. And you can click on that and see that, yes, continuous is selected. All right, Patrick, let's start with you. 20? To zero, okay. Chris? 20. 20. Bill? 61. 61, okay. Uh, Milan? 19. 19, okay. Shannon? 46. 46. And I'm 45. All right. Um, next one is what did we decide to do? Uh, not. Uh, oh, gender, right? Gender. So let's go ahead and uh, enter the new column, column three. So gender. Now, gender is uh, not a numeric data type, but it's a character, right? And moreover, what I'm going to do is actually. Uh, enter M and F for male, female, and then possibly I'm going to put an explanation inside my data set, okay? What M stands for and what F stands for, okay? So here I'm going to say character, and modeling type obviously is nominal, right? It can be nominal or ordinal, but it's not ordered, so therefore it's nominal. Okay, and 
I'm going to add one more thing here, okay? So column properties. You see that option right there, column properties? And uh, I'm looking for this property, value labels. In other words, M will have a label attached to that, and F, the value, will have a label attached to that, okay? I'm going to define value labels. And it basically shows up this window for me, value labels, okay? So here I'm going to say M stands for mail, mail, and I have to click on the add button to add that to the list of things, okay? And F, the value F, will stand for females. Female, and then I have to click uh, add. And look at that. Right now, my checkbox at the bottom says use value labels. In other words, I'm going to enter M and F, but it will actually show the labels, male and female, right? I can disable that. So let's actually try that. So I click apply and then OK. So Patrick is M, right? But it shows male because I just instructed that to show my labels, right, for the values. So I enter M, but it shows me the label, male, OK? Chris is M, feel M. It doesn't switch? It has to be a capital? Yeah, it's got to be a capital. Okay. Oh. Mine still not switching. Mine switched. Mine switched. You have to use a capital. Capital one. It is. Oh, you did? I didn't use it again. Huh. That's, that's weird. So let's let's look at that. Uh, after after we're done with, the, with this part, let's look at that, okay? So you take value labels. You use value Oh, yeah. You use value labels. Oh, it was automatically in my unclick. Oh, okay. So if you click it, it will show up, but if you unclick it, it will show M and F. That's what I was going to illustrate. So Milan is female, so F, Shannon is F, and Dmitri is M, right? So right now it's showing male, female, right? So I enter actually one single letter, right? And it shows me the label. So if I want to go back to the original showing of my just values, M and F, all I have to do is go back and unclick that, saying do not use the value labels, and when I click OK, it will show me the original things that I entered, actual data, M and F, right? So you can switch back and forth between showing labels <coughs> versus showing the full description of what it is, okay? And uh, let's use uh, another column, another variable, right? Parking at CNU. Parking underscore at underscore CNU. And that's going to be also a character. No, actually, you know what? Let's use a number because we assign numbers, right, to these things, right? One being poor, etc., etc. So let it be a number as the value of the variable. But my modeling type is going to be nominal, no, ordinal. Uh-huh, Shannon? You have to have the underscores that doesn't accept spaces. No, it, it does accept spaces, yeah. I, I use underscores, oh, I see. P parking underscore at senior, right? It comes from my database side. When you create a database, every column, should be preferably a continuous name, so therefore underscores. So I use underscores. You don't have to use underscores. You can use spaces. Yeah, it's just my programming side comes through basically. Okay, so uh, I'm going to uh, use numeric variables, but uh, still going to treat them as nominal. Oh, actually ordinal, right? Because one poor, two fair, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay, and I'm going to again click on the column properties and say value labels, and one stands for poor. Right. Add two stands for fair. Add three stands for uh, okay. Add and then four stands for good. Add and five stands for excellent. Add and again I'm going to use the value labels. So therefore every time when I enter a new number. It's going to actually show for me what it means, right? Poor, fair, etc., etc. Okay. So, Patrick, I believe you didn't participate in the survey, right? What do you think about parking it's in on the scale one through five? One being worse. Three. Okay. Three means okay. All right. Then, uh, Chris, what did you say? Two. Two. Okay. Phil. Three. Three. Okay. Milan. Three. three. You're changing your uh, responses, aren't you, guys? Okay, Shannon? Five. Five, and I was four, I believe. Okay, and you can see that uh, as I enter the data, uh, it basically changes my one, two, three, four, five into the labels, right? And again, if I want to show the data, 
In the first place, I have to uncheck this thing, and then it shows me the data. Okay? And uh, note that uh, the last one that we entered, parking it's in you, because we picked ordinal data type, uh, the icon is different, right? So now it's green bars, which are kind of increasing, right? So therefore, there you go. You can visually tell by looking at uh, jump, list of columns, list of variables, what data type you're dealing with, right? So out of all things that we entered so far, four variables, age is numerical, name and gender are nominal, and parking at CNU is ordinal. And you can see that by clicking at the column, it says ordinal, okay? Make sense? Easy, right? Simple. And uh, after that, we can save the file, right? So if you click on the, f uh, on the save icon, this old style, you know, disk kind of thing, and uh, I typically place them on the desktop just so that I don't lose them. So on the desktop, and you can see that the extension for the jump files are JMP, right? So I'm going to call it survey.jump, okay? And save it, that's it. So part of the homework that I will assign today will be actually do exactly that, okay? Go through these extras, uh, through a series of data points, create a new data table, enter them, define columns, define the data types, so just, just to have practice, and then you're supposed to save the file and email it to me, okay? We cool? All right, very good. Okay, let's see if I can switch back to my slides. Okay, good, I can switch back to my slides. All right, so now that we have an introductory understanding of like uh, how, how the jump works, let's actually uh, continue, all right? Uh, probably we have enough time to do one more exercise, okay? To create a uh, tabular summary and graphical summary as well for the nominal data, okay? So uh, the most popular graphical tool for the data is some sort of the bar chart, okay? So we discussed that data has two flavors, right? It can be continuous or interval, or it can be categorical, right? Categorical in turn splits into ordinal and nominal, but from the big picture standpoint we have uh, ordinal data or categorical data and continuous data, okay? So uh, any of these uh, uh, data types uh, can be represented as a picture and the most popular probably way to graphically or, uh, or visually represent the data is a bar chart, okay? So here is one problem that we're going to take a look at, employment example. Student placement office at the university conducted a survey from the graduates to determine where they find the employment and what general areas. So why, why is that important? Well, based on you know, which uh, area of employment our graduates find, we as a university may direct our efforts to bring employers on campus, right? If most of our people end up in management positions, for example, regardless of their majors, we may want to bring more uh, management uh, companies, right? More man management um, positions on campus, try to find them, right? Uh, finance, if finance is most popular, then we, we're going to make more contact with, you know, banks, uh, investment companies, etc., uh, etc. Et so, we asked a number of graduates to tell uh, what's their area of employment, and we call them as following. One stands for accounting, four finance, five management, four marketing, and five other. Other meaning can be something else, right? So one of our graduates, for example, from 2000 and, oh gosh, 13, oh, probably more uh, before that, he works right now as a flight attendant. Another graduate works as a police officer, okay? Another one works as the uh, golf equipment tester. So they're not necessarily, you know, finding the employment in, in, their, uh, in their major areas. Okay, so uh, what I want to show you is, uh, how to bring the data that's already saved into the jump, okay? And that's probably the only time, like this class and also homework, when you have to import the data from Excel file. So for the rest of the semester, I will give you jump file. When you double click it, it opens up and jump. No action required. You can pretty much go straight to the analysis, okay? So the data are saved in the Excel file. All right, and let's take a look. Oh, here we go again. I cannot see my uh, jump window here, right? Okay, hold on. I have to stop recording here and start a new session. One, okay. Welcome back. 
and uh, let's download the file, okay? So you should have it on your scholar or in the email, if I send you an email. So it's posted online in Jump datasets, and for the time being, we're going to use Excel data. So obviously you can uh, enter data in any program that you like. You can store it as comma-separated values as a plain text file, or you can store it in Excel. But the majority of tools, uh, not the majority, pretty much 100% of tools, they're integrated with Excel, because Excel is pretty much de facto standard program that's used by any organization, right? So it's a very natural way to store data. So let's download employment file. And that's Excel file right there. Okay, I believe I actually have it stored. So go ahead and open the file. The reason why it's not going to work for me is I have Windows 8, I believe, and it's very peculiar if you download the file from internet and it's Excel or Word, you have to first unlock the file, so it blocks everything that you download. So I'm going to open it. So go ahead and open up the file that you um, downloaded and save it on the desktop, okay? So that you can find it easily. All right, so my data sets, uh, here's my employment data set. So I'm going to open up employment data set, and there it is. Okay, so here's a bunch of observations, employment, um, what's the first uh, person that we surveyed? What did he say about his area of employment? Accounting, right? One stands for accounting. Four means marketing, I believe, right? Five means other. So guy number three, whoever that was, they are not working as accountant or finance or management or marketing, something else, right? Okay, so uh, I'm going to save that on the desktop. Just like you guys. So desktop, I will save the file employment. Save it, okay. And now uh, what I want to do is bring that into jump, right? So here is my jump. Uh, and bringing things into jump is very easy. So all I have to do is click, uh, there is a shortcut right there that says open, or I can go through the file, open, same thing. And all I have to do really is to navigate to my desktop, and on the desktop, here is my file employment. Okay, where did that go? Okay, here. My file employment, and then I just click OK, open. And the first thing that you will see is Excel import wizard. Pretty much, <laughs> the program is smart enough to understand uh, where is your title, and where is your data, so therefore, that's probably how I want to bring data into Jump, right? My title, employment, that's actually was my first first row in the data set, right? It says, well, the rest of them are numbers, and that one is not, that one's probably title, so let's put it as a column name. All right, so I'm not going to change anything here, just say import, very straightforward, and there it is, okay? So it creates a new data table for you, and note that, uh, all of my numbers are here, and uh, the data, the jump recognizes that there is only one column, one variable employment, but note the data type. What, what jump assigns as a data type by default, based on the values that it sees? Continuous, right? And obviously, one, two, three, four, five, accounting, finance, they're not continuous. What type of data is that? What do you think, guys? Milan, what do you think? Accounting, finance, etc. Well, these are not numbers, obviously, right? So they should be categorical, right? But which one? Nominal or ordinal? Nominal, right? Some people may say, what do you mean nominal? Accounting is the best, right? Because you're guaranteed an employment if you're an accounting major. Well, non-accountants would disagree, right? So therefore, there is no clear order between these categories. So therefore, I'm going to label them as nominal, okay? So I need to change the uh, modeling type, right? So here's how I do that. I click, double click on employment column name and it will show up this window for me, okay? So I'm still going to keep my numbers, so the data type is numeric, but modeling type, instead of continuous, I will pick nominal. And moreover, I will actually assign descriptions or labels to my categories, right? just like I did before. So I go to the column properties and pick on the value labels 
and here I'm gonna say one is accounting okay add two is finance add three is what was that management management add four is marketing Add and five is other. Add. Okay. And since uh, my check mark is in place, it says use value labels, it's going to show is marketing, finance, accounting, etc. Right? And not one, two, three, four. Okay, there it is. Alright, now what I'm going to do is create it's all about pictures, right? This part of our today's lecture is about how do you put a picture on the data, okay? Uh, so, I want to show the distribution of my variable, because that's what we mean by picture, how the variable is distributed, right? So, there are a couple of ways how we can do it. Number one is there is a shortcut up there, uh, and every time when you put a mouse over something, it shows you the help, it's called tooltip, right? It's like a little narrative descriptor, what, what is that? So, here is the button that calls up the description window, or you can do the same thing from analysis, and the first thing that you see on the top is description oh distribution right so uh, let me go ahead and use this shortcut okay distribution so you will see this window and uh, right here on the left side you have list of columns well we have only one column one variable so list is not that high right not that long uh, so the only thing that I have to do is take employment and drag it into the Y column and that's it. After that, I have to click OK button, and it creates the distribution for me. So it's really straightforward. OK. So here, uh, I go to the distribution, or analyze distribution. Doesn't matter. It's the same thing, right? And what I want to plot, it can be actually more than one column right here. But I have only one, so that's it. Uh, just add that to Y columns, or simply drag and drop. Same thing, OK? And when I click OK, it just gives a distribution for me. Does it work? OK. Now, note that one thing uh, that you will see is unusual is distribution is vertical, right? Typically, the distribution has like horizontal view, right? Jump by default is actually part of the settings. So you can change the global settings of the program so that every time when it shows you distribution, it's a horizontal view. The reason why it shows you vertical distribution is it's kind of a library kind of deal, right? When you go to the library, books are stacked vertically on the shelves, right? They're not placed horizontally. So this way, Jump kind of believes that they can fit in, in one window, they can fit side by side more, more distributions if you want to see like more of them. You know, on one screen, that's the way to go. Okay, so by default, it's vertical. So how can you make it horizontal, more traditional view? Uh, everything that you want to do with, uh, you know, your histogram uh, is uh, hidden actually behind the red triangle. Here we have a couple of red triangles, right? So if you click on the red triangle, you will see some menu items, okay? So one menu item says stack. And stacking does exactly that. It turns basically distribution 90 degrees, okay? From Vertical, it makes it horizontal. So if you click on the stack, that's a more traditional form okay, of the distribution. Make sense? And you can resize this thing. So if it looks too small, then you can just go ahead and kind of hook up the lower corner of the distribution and drag it, make it larger. Okay. But uh, the important thing is that it gives you... Uh, you can't resize this part, right? Yeah, you can't resize... Uh, important thing is uh, not only it gives you the picture, this is the picture of my data, right, bar chart. Uh, uh, it also uh, gives you the tabular summary. So it says that, uh, first of all, total number of observations in my data set is 252. We call it sample size, right? How large is your sample? So out of these 252 observations, 72 count were uh, accounting response 52 finance and management marketing and just by looking by the way at this picture uh, remember the purpose of this analysis was to find out what was the most popular area of employment second most popular etc etc right to focus you know our efforts on bringing this type of employers on campus so visually speaking which which area of employment is the most popular counting second marketing then we have Finance and then management and uh, 
11%, right? Because probabilities, this is the column for probabilities. Really what that means is it's a proportion, right? Proportion of people, proportion of responses other, for example, out of total, right? So this 28 out of uh, 252 represents uh, what 11.1 percent, right, of the entire data set. That's basically what it says. Uh, now to make things more visually appealing and more you know clear to see kind of thing, I can modify the way my histogram looks. For example. Uh, for one thing, I can go ahead and show counts, right? So these counts that I have computed over here or probabilities, I can go ahead and display. So how do I do that? Well, if I go to another red triangle, it has the whole menu hidden behind that, right? And histogram options, these are all things that I can show, okay? I can show standard uh, error bars. Here, separate bars, let's, let's try that. Separate bars, see what it does? It puts a little bit space between my bars, makes them more kind of stand separate, right, from each other. So it, may, I guess, makes it a little bit more readable, right? Another thing that I can show over here is, let's take a look, a histogram options. If I want to show counts, it will, on the top of every bar, show me pretty much this column, counts, right? How many observations fall into every category. And that way, not only I can judge the uh, kind of popularity of that specific area of employment just simply by the height of the column, but also numbers. Like, for example, if I can't quite make the difference between accounting and marketing, numbers will help me, right? If I want to show percentages, and I can go ahead and do that, Instagram options, show percentages, and uh, there you go, it shows, I believe, both of them right now, right? 72, and then comma, 29%. This is 52 count and that represents 21 percent okay uh and after that actually this is it pretty much this is how you put a picture on a data if the data are ordinal or nominal that's called the bar chart that's one of the most popular tools for the bar chart and that part right there represents the just tabular summary right uh, i can uh, copy paste for example if i want to add that picture to my report if i'm typing some sort of the executive report or something like that I believe the way to copy that, it's kind of, they, they, they hide it. Jump, you see that very thin stripe on the top? If you uh, point, point on that, it shows up. If you get out, it hides, basically. So if you show up this, uh, uh, this strip with, with tools, this tool, I believe, it says selection. It looks like a fat cross, right? So if you click on the selection uh, and then click on the bar, chart it highlights the whole bar chart and now we can copy that and you can open up word document or powerpoint document or excel anything you want you can insert so basically it copies the picture that's it okay so you can insert it in the email or your word document that you're sharing with uh, with your peers okay so that's pretty much how you copy paste things from from jump okay so make sense any questions Concerns, complaints, sarcastic comments. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we have actually another 15 minutes. So do you want to start a new problem or was that enough for today? <laughs> okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's have...